Y'all turn to John chapter 1. We're going to keep talking about this fig tree. We're just going to pick right back up with it. <clears throat> now remember we just read a story in Jeremiah about two baskets of figs. One basket accepted the chastisement of God. They took, God said, this is how it's going to be. They took him at his word and they went to Babylon. The other resisted the word of God. They wouldn't believe it and therefore they tried to stay in the land. They run over to Egypt and yet God got them wherever they went. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got these two baskets, good figs and bad figs. And we're talking about comparing that to how under the law of Moses there's only two outcomes. The person that resists what the law says about them and insists that they can be good and righteous. Or the person that accepts what the law says about them, that they're rotten to the core. Now that's the two, right? Well, watch what it says here in John 1, verse 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find a Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Now all these people have been baptized by John. So what does that tell you? What have they done? They've Amen. confessed Amen. failure and admitted it, right? It says, verse 45, Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith to him, Come and see. Now think about it. This man, Nathanael, knows that the Word of God says that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. So did the leaders. But Nathanael is going to, when he sees different testimony, he's going to believe the words of Jesus Christ. Those, those Pharisees used that birth in Bethlehem to say he's from Nazareth, this can't be the man. Watch what happens with this guy, verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. When he says this is an Israelite indeed, what's he implying? He's not there. So then there's some people calling themselves Israelites that aren't Israelites, right? Remember what Paul said over here? He said, not all Israel's Israel. Which Israel's Israel? Believing Israel. So he says this guy's got no guile in him. Guile is also translated deceit. Subtlety, right? Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who does your heart deceive? You. Folks, your heart doesn't deceive other people. You might form a plan in your brain and with your mouth deceive them, but not your heart. Hey, your heart deceives you. What does the heart of a man deceive him into believing? He's righteous, or he can be righteous. So he says, Nathaniel's got none of this in him. Then what's Nathaniel know about himself? He's rotten. He's a sinner. He's, he's convicted under the law. <clears throat> so verse 48, Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. What did he just imply Nathanael was? He's a good fig, folks. This man had done exactly what the law was intended to do. He had seen his guilt. He's not denying that. There's no guile in him. This guy is ready to hear the truth. So watch what happens next. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Did he have any trouble believing the identity of Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Why not? The veil of self-righteousness is gone. This man wasn't looking through anything through the eyes of the law. This man was convicted, looking for a Savior, wasn't he? Jesus Christ it comes and Nathanael believes like that. How about the rest of them? Folks, those people that were baptized by John, these Peter, James, John, and them, they've already seen their guilt, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Right? Now, remember a rich young ruler that come to Jesus and said, what must I do? Right? Had he seen that he couldn't do anything yet? No. 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 So what did Jesus tell him to do? To go keep the law. Why would he tell him that? Because the law is a schoolmaster. To teach him he can't. Folks, the, the person that's never said, you run into somebody over here today. Look, 2016, you run into a person that says they're not a sinner. Where should you go? Go to Exodus 20. Start reading the law to them. Say, we're not under the law. No, we're not under the law. But until I confess that I'm a sinner to myself, I ain't never going to see what Christ did. Now, 1 John 1, 9, I know who it's written to. But right before it in John, he says... If we say we have no sin, we lie and deceive ourselves. What's he say next? But if we confess our sin, well, religion took that and, and made it, you've got to confess each sin to get it forgiven, right? 
No. What are you going to have to do to call on the Lord? You're going to have to see you need saving, aren't you? You're going to have to see what you are. It's just like this basket of figs. So now back to these figs. <clears throat> Alright, it says he's going to give them a heart. Right? Remember when we read? Go back to Jeremiah 24. We're not going to read the whole thing. If, if you watch this in its part 2, you have to watch part 1. Or go read Jeremiah 24, 1 through 10. He says in uh, Jeremiah 24, 5. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, like these good figs, that's what Nathaniel was, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, will bring them unto the, again to this land, will build them, not pull them down, I will plant them, not pluck them up, and I will give them an heart to know me, and they shall be my people. And all. Is God going to give them a heart? When you give someone something, what is that person receiving? A gift. A gift. Got anything to do with works? Mm -hmm. How did Paul say we're saved? By grace. by grace. By a gift. It's the gift of God. Flip over real quick to uh, Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. All right, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now later, this is going to be extended, but at this time, he says, Israel and Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. In other words, it ain't going to be according to the old one that made the fig tree, is it? Mm -hmm. Not Moses. He said, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law, my words, in their inward parts, write it in their hearts. They shall be, the, be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall no more teach every man his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord. For uh, they shall all know me. In other words, who's going to be the teacher under this new system? The Holy Ghost. And everybody that's in the body is going to have the teacher, aren't they? Okay. Go over to uh, Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36, 24. Alright, he says, For I will take you among the heathen, gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Now, I know physically he's going to do this in the future with all, all those that believers, but on the day of Pentecost, did Jews come back from every country on earth, it says? Verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. Now there's an individual application of this, and there's a national application. Isn't there? Individually, when were people able to get sprinkled with clean water? Once Christ died for the sins. Can you be washed clean? He did it. All you've got to do is believe, right? But nationally, when will that nation get theirs? Over here. That doesn't apply to Peter, James, and John just because they got Jewish blood. Folks, they believe. They're redeemed, right? What about an unbelieving Israel that's left alive over here? At the second coming, what are they going to see? They're going to see Him who they pierced. They're going to wail and mourn, aren't they? Okay, so that, that's the future. Water coming out of the temple and all that. Now, he says, verse 26, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. What would you call a heart that believed it could keep the Ten Commandments? Stony. stony, written on stone, right? Take that out of you, give you a new heart. I will put my spirit within you and cause you. In other words, they're not going to do it. The Lord's causing it, isn't He? What causes me and you to want to walk in the, in the way the Lord would have us walk? His word, his spirit, folks, it causes it. So he goes on talking about these, but I just want you to see this is what he's talking about. So in order for him to give them this new heart by a gift, what had to be done away with? No, no, no. This month, right? Okay, now, um, let's see. We got the judgment of God. Uh, Zedekiah, real quick. Back here when God told Israel, go into captivity. 
Now that judgment is decreed on, on Judah, I mean. As Judah goes off, those that believe God. Can anybody give me, think of an example back there when Nebuchadnezzar come to town of good figs? Can not think of any? How about Daniel? Yeah. Uh, Meshach, Shadrach, Abednego, Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezekiel, Mordecai. Those are people that listened what God's word judged them, chastised them, and they accepted the punishment, didn't they? What do they all have in common? They got saved. They got believed, right? Can anybody think of an example of the bad figs? How about King Zedekiah? Who did God give that land to? Babylon. Who tried to stay there and rule in that land? Zedekiah. Y'all know who appointed Zedekiah king? Babylon. What about the people that stayed in the land? Did God tell them to stay in that land gathered or come, go where He told them to go? Go where He told uh -huh. them to go. According to this covenant, there was a, a, a penalty that was going to come on this people for unbelief, right? And the penalty is they're going to be scattered in all the world until God regathers them, right? Well, if they're scattered over here and they regather themselves, are they going against the judgment of God? Yes. What if they appoint a king? Are they going against the judgment of God? Mm -hmm. When I read this, I think about Netanyahu and them people over there. Are they succumbing or are they uh, bowing down to the decree of God? No, no, folks, they're standing up fighting against it. It got nothing to do with the Lord. That's like the bad figs. All right. Um, let's see. All right, we talked about the two types of figs the Pharisee and the publican, Martha and Mary, Cain and Abel. In other words, the difference in the two is one believes what the Word of God says, the other does not. One accepts the judgment of the Word of God, the other does not. So I come over here. What does the Word of God say about all men? All vile creatures. All vile sinners, right? Any difference one to the other. But what does mankind say? Varying degrees, right? Yeah. How special. <laughs> Y'all think about this. Religion doesn't say they're not sinners. But religion doesn't believe what the Word of God says about them. <coughs> religion, and it's subtle, it's very subtle. Religion says, well, I know I've sinned, but... There ain't no but to it. Mm -hmm. If you break one commandment, how many would you be guilty of? Oh, oh. Well. Then religion believes that, yes, I've, I've fouled up some, but I have outperformed my neighbor, therefore I am more deserving of God's righteousness than my neighbor. That person got God's righteousness. Mm -hmm. How are they going to put on the robe of God when they got their own robe on? How are you going to put on a new robe when you still got one hand stuck in the other one? Do you not? You got to strip naked, don't you? What do we and you going to have to see about ourselves? We have zero righteousness. They don't lick a difference between any of us. Okay. Now we're talking about these couples: Pharisee and the publican, Martha and Mary, Cain and Abel. Right? I want to go look at a set from the Old Testament, Genesis four. <coughs> 40. Yep, Genesis 40. I, I love how all through the Old Testament we've got all these stories back here. And if we really look at them, we can see there's a spiritual significance to them. It's very important. Alright, Genesis 40. We've got two characters here. A butler and a baker. Now, remember Joseph, more than any other character in Scripture, Joseph and the events in his life are, are pictures of things Jesus Christ did. He's type, types of Jesus Christ. Joseph's brethren sold him out, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Whose idea was it? Judah. Sold him for some silver, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Which, how do you say Judah in Greek? Judas, right? Did Judas sell Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. So, he's down here. Now, watch verse uh, chapter 40, verse 1. It came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended the Lord there, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. He put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, a place where Joseph was bound. Joseph's in prison and these two men are cast there with him, right? captain of the guard charged Joseph with them. He served them, and they continued a season in the war. They dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream in one night. Each man, according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. Now, before we go any further, I want you all to think about a butler and a baker. 
right? What does a butler do? Servant. Servant. What does a baker do? Bakes. Bakes. Which one produces something? Baker. Which one produces nothing? Servant. The servant. All the servant does is serves up what has been provided to him, right? Mm -hmm. But the baker takes what God made and begins working on it and makes it better. He adds to it. He makes it more palatable, more flavorable, so we'll like it, right? Mm -hmm. This is what it's about. Now watch. He, uh, Joseph came into them in the morning, verse 6, and looked upon them. Behold, they were very sad. Or sad. He asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look you sadly today? They said unto him, We have dreamed a dream. There is no interpreter of it. Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. The chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. Now can a man produce a vine? Nope. He said, And in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes, pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. All this man did was took God's product and passed it out, didn't he? All right, it says verse uh, 12. Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place. Thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after a former manner when thou wast his butler. In other words, you're going to be saved, right? Now we come on down to save time, verse 16. When the chief baker saw the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. Notice the baskets now. Mm -hmm. In the uppermost basket there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the baskets upon my head. What do the birds in Scripture, the fowls of the air, represent? Demons and spirits and devils. What about bread? Baked meats. Word of God. What about leavened bread? Bad doctrine, folks. He's got these baskets full of this tasty bread, right? Is the Word of God tasty? When you start seeing what it really says about you at first, ain't nothing tasty about it, is there? But what if I could come along and say to you, you were under, this happens a lot, I see this. <clears throat> you go to a class and someone is under conviction about their sin nature, about being lost. And you can see them under conviction. There's one guy that comes to classes and he does it all the time and it's like I just want to slap him. Not because I'm better, but he's doing something he ought not do. I learned this the hard way. This person is in turmoil and this guy comes over and consoles them. Oh, it's okay. It ain't, it's okay. No, folks, leave that person alone. Let that person be in turmoil. That person is seeing the light of the Word of God and not liking what it says about them. Are you doing them any good to lessen the blow? No. What did Israel do with the law? They lessened the blow, folks. They said, you don't got to keep all of them. I mean, we try this one and that one, but he never said this. And they twisted and turned to where they got them all worked out just right, didn't they? Okay, now, this guy has this thing and the birds are eating it. Verse 20. <clears throat> it came to pass the third day. Y'all reckon the third day is a coincidence? What's that remind you of? Resurrection. Resurrection. He said, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast. By the way, it's fascinating here. It's Pharaoh's birthday. He made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief butler under his butlership again. He gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to him. Is Joseph in prison? And we got two guys in there side by side with him, don't we? <clears throat> Did Jesus Christ die on the cross? Mm -hmm. yeah. Who was on each side of him? Guess what happened to one of these men on the third day? He, he took off of Christ, didn't he? Mm -hmm. One of them went on down. Now watch the difference between them. Go over to Luke. Luke 23. This is no, this is just the exact same story told over and over and over in Scripture. Luke what? Luke 23. Luke 
It says, one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him. Now you read earlier, both of them had been railing on him, right? Mm -hmm. But some things began to happen up there on the cross, didn't they? Did God testify that day <coughs> that this was the Son of God? Yes. How did God testify to the Jews? Signs mm -hmm. and miracles. Mm -hmm. What started to happen up there around noon? Yeah, don't Sun die. turned dark, earthquakes, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them are railing on him, right? Are both of these men guilty? Yes. Yes. They're both just murderers and thieves are guilty, aren't they? Is one more guilty than the other? Mm -hmm. Is there a lipid difference in their flesh? Mm -hmm. okay, watch what happens. One of the male factors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. He's laughing, and, and or I doubt he's laughing, but he's saying the same things the people that are around there are saying, right? Verse 40, But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. What was the difference between these two? Nothing. One accepted the judgment. Did one of them say, I'm getting exactly what I deserve? Yeah. Yeah. Were they both getting what they deserve? Yeah. Then what was the difference? One, one of them's one confessing it. One of them admits it. What's the difference in the two baskets of figs? Yeah. One yeah. of them accepted the judgment of God and went on into captivity, didn't he? You know what Jesus Christ says to this guy? Watch. He just got done saying, We're, I'm getting what I deserve, but not this man. Verse 42. He said unto Jesus, Lord. Did he just confess him as the Lord? Mm -hmm. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Y'all see them two baskets right there? Yeah. The, good, the good one confessed. This one railed. You think about religion today. That's what it's about, folks. Religion rails against what the Word of God says about them. Even the ones that study the Word of God in the deepest manner won't believe what it really says about them. They believe that I find the people that study the most. Uh, I'll tell you what I find. I have found people that say they are the most open-minded, and they'll tell you all the time, that they believe, for instance, like 1 Corinthians 8.1. If a man say no, something knows nothing at all. I find most people that make that statement are the most hard-headed, prideful, refuse to listen. You can talk to them about Scripture, and they'll give you their Scriptures, and you say, okay, well, I see there what you're saying. I understand why you're saying it, but what about this Scripture? And they'll just say, mm -hmm, well, over and so. No, what about this Scripture? Well, let's go over here. What about this Scripture, right? Ain't none of us know anything. This man on the cross that day knew one thing. I'm in the wrong. He's in the right. That's all he knew. That's all you ever got to know. You can always know that no matter what, you and your flesh and your ideas and your works are in the wrong. And the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is always right. I don't care who you talk to or what you know about the Lord. No matter what they say, how could you go wrong answering them? Thank God Jesus Christ died for my sins. I don't care what they say. Somebody said, look like it's going to rain today. I say, yeah, thank God Jesus Christ died for my sins. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Who's the saints play today? Well, I don't know. Thank God Jesus Christ died for my sins. Seriously, folks, it's, that's it. Mm -hmm. And now, he goes on with this idea here with this, uh, with this thief because he says uh, to him he's going to be with him in paradise. Now, what happened to this guy on the third day? Where'd paradise go? According to Paul, at the third day, it's up. It? <clears throat> so what happened to the uh, butler on the third day? He got lifted up out of that prison, didn't he? What happened to this man on the third day? He got lifted up, folks. Not physically, okay? Not physically. Paradise got moved. All right, let's see. Go to uh, 2 Timothy 3. Second Timothy 3.16. Alright, 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, All Scripture. Does that eliminate any Scripture? No. So do we have any authority to say, well, we don't need this or we don't need that? No. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 
then even after the person is saved, what do we continue to have to say? I'm wrong, but this book is right. I don't care what it is. I'm always wrong, but this book is always right. Now, as we study, what's this book designed to do? Teach, you. Teach us. Well, guess what teaching involves? Learning. Changing learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you learn something that you didn't change know before, mind. you got to have to change your mind, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Then is there an ongoing repentance that comes along with it? Yeah, we got to be willing to change our mind about what we think we believe, don't we? Folks, most people don't want to do that. Seriously, most do not. Um, but never mind. Verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect. That means mature. Right? If you've got a kid that's got training wheels on their bike and they get into an age and they will not take the training wheels off, are they going to go any further? They need to just admit, I don't. this is a problem here, right? But they won't admit that. So what do they do? They stay on those training wheels. So he says, uh, Throughly furnished unto all good works. You got the kid that learns with the training wheels, and it's time they're old enough, they're mature enough to take the training wheels off. But folks, they usually don't take off riding on jet. What usually happens? They wobbly, they fall down, they skin up. Oh, hey, ain't nothing like I'm telling y'all getting skin up by the scripture. It look, it's a humbling thing to teach something, to and just know that you're right and then find out later you're just as wrong as could be. You know what that does to you? It lets you know, I'm always probably wrong. But the Word of God's not. If you read a scripture and that scripture causes problems, and you can't read the entire context and explain what he's talking about, if you've got to circumvent that scripture, and when presented with plain scripture, if you can't give a yes or no answer on it, look deeper. Well, you said something about if you have a problem like that, just ask God. Ask the Lord, sure. Study it and God will show it to you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Ask the Lord, that's right. Okay, now, uh, uh, tell you what, go over to Mark 11 real quick. We talked about the barren fig tree, but let's go look at the another uh, version of it. Mark 11. All right. If you and I start counting time back here, I'm going to do it in black so it stands up. All right. If you and I pick the time back here, okay, I'm going to say here's the cross, right? God told Daniel back here there was going to be so much time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. He told him exactly how much time it was going to be until some things happened, didn't he? Now, when Jesus Christ first appears, he's in Cana, and his mom tells him they, they need wine. Do you remember what he said to her? My time is not yet. When it says in Galatians 4, when the fullness of the time was come, then was there some time that was counting? Yeah. Did, what does it mean, the fullness of the time? It's time, right? So then there came a time when it was time for Jesus Christ to do what he came to do. Okay? Now I find out from, from other places in Scripture, many places, how long do we know the ministry of Jesus Christ was? It's three and a half years. You can prove it all kind of ways, right? But according to the Old Testament prophecy, how, when did the Passover lamb get identified as the Passover lamb? The tenth day of the first month, right? That's the day they took him out from among all the others and set him aside. What did they do for four days? They watched him for blemish, right? What day does Jesus Christ come riding into town on a donkey? The tenth day of the first month, okay? That is going to bring us to exactly a point, and the next day will be a starting something new. Did he present himself as king on that day? It says it was the fulfillment of the scriptures, right? So he set himself apart, marked himself, and for the next four days, what did the leaders do? They examined him all they could, and he dies on the 14th day, doesn't he? On the 14th day, Passover. Okay. Watch when he comes into town. Mark 11, 1. When they came nigh to Jerusalem on the Beth page, Bethany, the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples. He comes riding in, exactly like the Old Testament scripture said the king would present himself. Then is he the king? Mm -hmm. Then is there any way he's presenting himself here as a candidate to be the king, or is he the king? He's the king. He's the king. Is it only going to be at the second coming that he'll be the king? 
Folks, he's the king right now. Okay. Now he says, uh, he comes into town and they do this. And then come on to verse 12. On the morrow, the 11th day. I'm going to put it right here. So I'm going to draw a big ending point right here. Like this. And now we're going to see something happens on the 11th day. On the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. So he just absolutely cursed this thing on the 11th day, didn't he? Now come on down to verse uh, 20. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Is the fig tree withered away? Mm -hmm. Do y'all reckon the fig tree goes on this side of the cross? I always had it coming over here for another year, huh? Did, I mean, look, did the fig tree just end right there? Mm -hmm. Did he say, let no fruit grow on it henceforth forever? Yeah. The guy would say, yeah, but, there ain't no but to it. Folks, if the Lord just cursed that fig tree, roots and all, is that the end of the fig tree? Okay. Yeah. So what did Jesus Christ nail to the cross? Law. He nails the law to the cross. Folks, it's done, it's finished. There ain't nobody getting, the fig tree means nothing over here. Who in the world over here, what's, what's Moses' law going to do over here? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, so now the fig tree comes to an end. Now let's see if this all matches up in Scripture. Um, Taylor, just to prove this to you about the roots. <clears throat> when it says it's dried up from the roots, right? It means right out of the roots, the whole thing. It's 100% dried up. Y'all remember in Daniel when uh, Nebuchadnezzar was going to lose his kingdom for seven years? And he had a dream about a tree. Remember that? And Daniel comes in and interprets the dream. He said, I saw a tree cut down and it, it cut down and died, but the trunk and the roots stayed, grow, stayed good, didn't it? And he said, that's because in seven years you're going to get your kingdom back. The roots stayed good, didn't they? Did the roots of that fig tree stay good? How is Jesus Christ going to establish a new covenant and have the old one running at the same time? Now, did he destroy Jerusalem right away? No. No, I could still see those covenant-keeping religious Jews in Jerusalem for another 40 years, couldn't I? But you know what? At the end of 40 years, that thing vanished away because their temple, the whole thing's gone. That's why Hebrews says, that which is waxed old is ready to vanish away. People say, well, it was still in effect. It doesn't say that. It says it's ready to vanish. You can't take one scripture against a whole bunch of other scriptures. Paul says... Point blank, that which is done away, it's done, it's finished. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 7 says it's finished. So when it says it's ready to vanish away, what happened to the visible system in 70 AD? It's gone. It's gone, right? Okay, now flip over to uh, Luke and let's look at our parable that started all of this. Luke 13. <laughs> Luke 13, 1. <clears throat> Alright, he says, There were present at that season. Now, we don't have time to do it, but y'all do it on your own. Everybody knows what a parallel account is, right? To lay the four so-called Gospels out and look at them. If you start counting time on this thing, we can find out something. We'll find out that Jesus went to Jerusalem for feast days, didn't he? And we can start counting time here and we'll see some things. I'm going to erase this here so we can do this. Alright? If you start figuring out when this is, you, you can correlate it to John chapter 7. The, the parallel verse comes in John 7. Jesus changes location. And Luke has been, he's been in the same location here for several chapters. Y'all just do it on your own, okay? But what you're going to find out is this is the event. Hold, hold Luke 13 and go over to John. Now, do this. I don't mean it's the parallel passage. I mean find out his location. And you find out his location and then you can figure out the time. And it's John 7, 1. It says, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, 
for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. Now this is up in Galilee. He's avoiding the Jews, not in Jerusalem. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. So where's Jesus going to go according to the law? He's going to go to Jerusalem to keep tabernacles, right? If you lay it out, you'll see that from here he goes to Jerusalem. And that's what's spoken in chapter 13. Look in chapter 13, verse 1, Luke. And I'm going to put it up here. I'm going to erase all of this so we can work with this. So. Alright. This is Tabernacles. The last Tabernacles before he dies. Okay, I'm going to put Tabernacles right here. Okay, so it's this last one where he says this parable that we're fixing to read. And again, don't believe me. Y'all check it out. Now it says, there were present at that season. It's the week of Tabernacles. Some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Most are not talking about some event that took place years ago. They're telling him something that just happened. Had some people had their blood. Pilate killed some people and mingled the blood with their sacrifices, right? Verse 2. Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? And ain't that what people say when bad things happen? Mm -hmm. So this group saying, Did you hear about the Galileans? Well, you, you know what got them. Now, what do religious-minded people say when something bad happens to somebody? Well, he must have been, huh? I mean, anything, the least little anything. He, Chris is home with a cold right now. Religious guy would say, he did something. God's getting him. <laughs> Folks, Chris got a cold because he got around somebody with a cold. That's how it works, isn't it? Now, he says, uh, verse 3, I tell you nay. They're not more sinful, are they? What did the law declare? All men exactly the same. Did the Jew believe that? No. He says, Nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What did John the Baptist tell them? Repent of their Jewish religion or suffer the wrath of God. Now, this is the same thing Jesus is telling them. Watch, he says, Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, Nay, but except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So in the context, what's he telling them? They're all the same, and unless you repent, you're going to perish, right? And remember what the repent is. They better quit trusting their religious righteousness. They better turn from that religious system and turn to the Lord, right? Now watch the parable. He spake also this parable right there at the same time. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Notice it don't say the man planted it, does it? Y'all know what it says in Matthew 21 about his vineyard? It says the man planted a vineyard. Did God ever plant that Jewish religion? No. God read the law to them to declare their unrighteousness. And what did Israel do? They hung there and said, we can do it. So we've got this, uh, this system here now. It's a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And what did we determine the fruit is? repentance folks it's designed to show them they're rotten isn't it so he comes seeking the fruit on them all right now watch how long the man seeks fruit then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard now the owner of the vineyard is god well then who's the man on the ground jesus christ i know some people i have friends that say this is peter it won't work it don't fit watch <coughs> behold these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. What does these indicate? Right there, current. He said, these three years. Now look, I'm going to draw it up here. Is this current? Yeah. Alright. I've got tabernacles right here. Okay. If I go back from tabernacles one year, what day will it be? Won't it be tabernacles? Yeah. Yeah. If I go a year back from Christmas this year, what will I be on? Christmas. Christmas. So from tabernacles to tabernacles, that's one year, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If I go back another year, what day will it be? Tabernacles. If I go back one more, what will it be? Now, without going there, we all know we'll, we'll have to do it here for Christmas. What day was Jesus Christ born on? Feast of Tabernacles. You can prove it from the Scripture. Feast of Tabernacles, He's born and on his 30th, when he began to be 30 years of age, he begins his ministry, doesn't he? 
How long was his ministry? So I got one year here, two years here, three years to tabernacles. How long is it from tabernacles to Passover? Six months, folks. Exactly six months. I'm going to put a half a year. Well, how long would that give me? Three and a half years. How long was his ministry? Three and a half years. But watch. He said these three years. Then it's current, isn't it? Yeah. But watch what he says next. He says, verse 7, he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down while cumbereth at the ground. He answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also. What does this indicate? Yeah. Current. <laughs> What's the only way it could be current? Both ways. If it's on the day of Feast of Tabernacles, is this three just come to an end? Yeah. But what remains in that year? Their year starts at Passover, doesn't it? According to Moses. How, how much time was left in the year? Six months. Give it this year also, and after that, cut it down. When Jesus Christ come right before the cross, did He cut it down? There's your three and a half years right there. I mean, it's, it's absolutely perfect. The law of Moses does not continue on this side of the cross. The husband died. Now, men kept on with it, but was God honoring that? No, no folks, you got a new high priest. How could Jesus Christ be a high priest under the law of Moses? He can't be. It's impossible. So we've got these three years here. After that, cut it down. Three years and a half, right there, it's cut down. Now, Daniel 9 tells us that he's going to go and uh, offer the people. He's going to confirm the covenant for half a week, right? And then what's going to happen in the middle of the week? He's going to be cut off, but not for himself. And then what happens? The message, the covenant, is confirmed to Israel for another three and a half, for another half of a week, isn't it? And I'm not sure exactly where that falls over here. I'm not sure if that falls with uh, Stephen, Paul, or Cornelius. I don't know. I don't know any way you can tell. Maybe somebody does know. I don't know. But after the cross, did they continue offering this new covenant to those people? They did. Now he said, I've got to dig about it and dung it. Right? What do you do when you dung something? Fertilize. fertilize. What is fertilize actually doing? Making it grow. Making it grow by doing what? Nurturing. Nurturing. <laughs> it's, is it supplying it what is needed? Yes. Right? It's supplying what's needed. Okay? What does the Bible say the Jews require? A sign. You get, your, you get your Bibles out and do this. Don't believe me, please, but do this. Look where Jesus Christ starts His ministry. Right? Is He spending all His time in Jerusalem or all in Galilee? It's in Galilee. Is He performing tons of miracles up in Galilee? That's the house of Israel, folks. Who had already been cut off and divorced? He said, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Where are you going to find the house of Judah at? In Jerusalem. Y'all know how many miracles Jesus Christ did from right here? This way. Study it out and look at all the miracles He performed. You know when He went to Jerusalem? For the feast days. Y'all know how many miracles He did in Jerusalem? One. John 5. One. Where was all His efforts at for the first three years? Guess what he does the last six months? He just rode in the tabernacles. We read it. You check it out and look where he spends the last six months of his ministry at. Among the house of Judah. What does he do there? Signs and wonders. Did he dung the house? Did I mean did he literally give Judah everything they needed to produce? Yeah. He did. And what did Judah do? Was Judah divorced back here or just the house of Israel? House of, the house of Israel. Wayne, why? Because we have a wise Judah not. He's got to bring forth the seed. He made a covenant with David, thereby his word made it necessary that they endure. Once Jesus Christ is brought forth and dies on the cross, does he need the house of Judah any longer? Now, He saves them first on Pentecost. They're there. He saves a remnant of them and they get the new covenants poured out on them. But, as a whole, what do they do with it? They reject it. And what's He do with it? He gives it to the Gentiles. 
the heathens. You've got it. So, y'all please don't believe me. You check this out and watch. Jesus Christ is up in Galilee all the time. He comes to Jerusalem for the feast days. Okay? Now, up here, He declares up here in Matthew 12 and uh, in John 12, He declares point blank up here that, hey, they've rejected me. No more signs will be given, to, right? Mm -hmm. But when He comes into Jerusalem, look at the miracles He starts doing. In John 9, He comes for tabernacles, and y'all know what He does right there? He heals a blind man. Remember the man born blind? No coincidence. So he heals the blind man and he performs, as far as I can tell, he performs eight miracles. Right? It might be seven, but I can't tell if you would consider one a miracle or not. But he performs bunches of miracles here. At least seven. Probably eight. But where does he spend the last six months of his life? Ministering in Judea. Okay? Judea. I'm saying Jerusalem. He's not in the city. He goes out to Perea and all. But where is he spending his time at? Judea. As opposed to where? Over here. Israel. Remember, you got ten tribes, right? And the two tribes. Jesus Christ comes first to this group. They don't want him. He got the, some of them do, don't they? And he comes to this group. What happens to this group's marriage contract at the cross? Done away, it's finished. Okay. All right, I don't know if I got any more, but I guess that's it. Got any questions about that?